Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your power. I thank you, God, for the hope that's in Christ. I'm asking God for each person in here, Lord. I pray for those that aren't saved. I lift them up to you, God, those that don't know you. Those that have been shaking their fists at you for a long time. I pray tonight would be the night you get them. I pray for those in this place that, uh, that are bashful. They're not where they need to be. I pray tonight that you get them right where they need to be, Lord. I pray that you meet them where they are. They be come under conviction of the Holy Spirit. I pray for those in this place that are discouraged. Maybe someone in here feels like they're too bad for God. That, that they've done too much. I pray, God, that the sermon tonight will hit them right where they are. I pray for myself, God, that you would clear my mind from distraction. Help me not be afraid of anything, Lord God, and be bold for you. I pray, God, that you use me for your glory as I preach the gospel. Help me be doctrinally sound. I pray for our kids upstairs. Uh, as they're learning the gospel, they're learning about Jesus Christ. I just pray that those seeds are playing in the hearts of the state. Pray for our security, that you give them eyes to hear and eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. We're going to read the first 15 verses. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Achan Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men have come here tonight with the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you and have entered your house. For they have come to the country, come to search out our country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. And she said, yes, the men did come. They had came to me, but I don't know where they went. And, as, and it happened as, as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, this is Rahab lying, that, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she brought them up on the roof and hid them within the stalks and flats, which she had laid in order to in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them on the road to Jordan to the board. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof and said, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Check this out. That the terror of that the terror of you, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. She was saying, everybody's scared because of you're here. The terror has fallen on us and your people. Verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord brought up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Shion and all, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted Neither did there remain any courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is the God of heaven above and on the earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will show me kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Verse 14. So the men, the men answered her, Our lives are yours, if none of you tell our business. And it shall be, when the Lord has given us the land, that we will, we will deal kindly with you, kindly and truly with you. Verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope to the window of her house. That was on the city wall. And then she that dwelt on the wall. Have you ever heard the phrase that came out of left field? That came out of left field. This is a phrase that has nothing to do with the field. Uh, I've said it plenty of times. It has to do with something happening no one seen coming. Uh, lots of things have uh, happened in my life that I didn't see coming. I've been kicked in 
here by the by the task force. I didn't see it coming. I, I, I've, I've had situations happen in people's lives and had people die. Didn't see it coming. It came out of left field. Maybe it was a football game. He was right in the middle of it. You were sure your team was going to win and they lost. Maybe it was an overtime game. All the way to the very end and in that overtime game you didn't see it coming. How about 9-11? I remember where I was at when 9-11 happened and I didn't see it coming. See, Joshua sent his spies on a top secret mission. Verse 2 says they sent them out by secret. So nobody knew. See, Joshua years before tried this. It was Josh, Moses and Joshua, Caleb, and 10 other spies from, 12, from the 12 tribes of Israel. Then they went in chapter 13 of the book of Numbers and they went down in the land. And when they went down in the land, 10 the spies were scared. 10 the spies seen a fight. 10 the spies seen the giants. 10 the spies seen the big walls. And they, and they, and they missed the fruit. They missed the blessings of God. And, and they all got scared because of the bad report. And so Joshua, in wisdom, sent these two spies out with nobody knowing but them and him and God. And he said, listen, get on down there and, 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 and check it out. Look and see exactly what it looks like, what the walls look like, what the enemy looks like. Get down there in secret. Don't tell nobody you're doing it. This was a secret mission. The Faith Hall of Fame in the book of Hebrews, you'll find one of the, one of the saints of God etched in the eternal word of God. And you never seen it coming. It was Rahab. See, Rahab is a superstar in the Bible. Rahab made it to the Hall of Faith. Hebrews chapter 11, Rahab is mentioned in you.
God, God changed her supernaturally. God allowed her to hear about him. Rahab believed God. Rahab believed God. She said, I know your God. It's the God of heaven. I know your God. It's the God of the earth. And I believe with fear and trembling that your God is the one true God. That's what had faith. And Abraham showed her faith by how she acted. She saved her lives. She risked her life.
See, Jericho was a key to, be, to conquering the promised land. This was a vital place for Joshua to take advantage of. Archaeologists say this, that there is a description of a double-walled city at the exact place that, that the Bible says Jericho was at. It was eight to nine acres. It had double walls around it. Rahab says, and the Bible says, he lived in the walls of the city. Joshua would conquer Jericho, go straight up the middle, split the land in half. This was a very, very vital key to Joshua's conquering the promised land. So let's talk about Rahab. Rahab took advantage of the opportunity God gave her. Rahab took advantage of the opportunity God gave her. What if Rahab would have doubted? What if Rahab would have analyzed that situation? What if Rahab would have questioned what was going on? What if Rahab would have tried to, try to figure out all these things? See, Rahab didn't mention her past. She didn't try to figure out how they got to her home. She didn't question the thing that did about anything. She didn't make excuses uh, for the fact that they came by or who were they or how they find her or try to question all those things. Rahab did one thing. She took advantage of the situation that God was giving her. She took advantage of the chance to have a new life. Listen, don't worry about that person how they got to invite you. Don't worry about how they knocked on your door. Don't worry about how they gave you a freeway car down to the library. Don't worry about how that person stepped up who they were or why you got there. Listen, it's God reaching out to you, trying to capture you and deliver you from the lifestyle.
How'd you get here? How'd you get here? What got you here? How many times does somebody have to invite you? That bus that picked you up, that friend that offered you a ride, that rehab you came from, how'd you get them sickness? God's been giving you a chance to be rescued from a life you've been living your whole life. And some of you are too stinking stubborn to climb on board and take the chance He's given you. And you're going to end up back in that darkness, back in that water, back in that old life, and you're going to end up back in that same seat if you're lucky, if you're blessed enough to get another chance to change your life. See, Rahab is a beautiful picture of salvation, guys. Rahab had heard the testimonies of what God was doing and she believed that there was a God who could save. She confessed that the God of Israel was the one true God. That's a really big statement. Rahab was in a pagan land. Nobody she knew was, was a believer in the God of Israel. They had a God of everything. But Rahab made that solid confession that he's the God of heaven and earth. Verse 9 says he's the one true God. She had conviction on her life. She pleaded for mercy from these men. And they gave her a covenant that was binding. They promised her that if she would keep her in the deal, they would keep her in the deal. Maybe you're in here tonight you heard the testimony. Maybe you're in here tonight you see one of these guys that used to run the streets and be the worst couple heads you ever met in your entire life. And you're here just to see what, what's going on in this place. Maybe, 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 maybe you're here tonight because you know Mikey and Mikey might be loved. And you see him on the other side of cops. And you knew him as a guy who carried a big gun. But, but, but now you know Mikey, who's a, who's, a, who's a single father, raising his little girl. He carried a big Bible. And he takes care of his family. And he's a good father. You know what's going on here. Maybe he's so very aged. He's very aged. He's been a person more times than I can count. He's been stabbed nine times, something like that. Been shot at. Never had a job in his whole life. Only time very aged. This woman came from a messed up place. 
Tonight I'm glad Jesus made it way for a wicked sinner like me. Like Rahab, I can say there's nothing that could deliver a man like me. There's nothing that could ever rescue me. There's nothing that could have saved me except for the power of God on me. See, Rahab's family was affected by her salvation. It just, it wasn't a salvation statement. She didn't keep it to herself. I think there's too many secret Christians. Don't nobody know you're a Christian because you don't tell nobody. It's like that guy who, who you work with at the restaurant and then all of a sudden one day he puts his wedding ring on. And you're like, oh, I never knew you were married, brother, by all the women you're sleeping with and behind the party you are with all the ladies in the restaurant. Did you put that wedding ring on your finger? See? Rahab couldn't keep it to herself. Rahab, Rahab got saved. And one thing that happens when someone gets saved is their family is affected by their salvation. Let me tell you something. Rahab wasn't just concerned about herself. Rahab wanted to help as many people as she could. Rahab wanted to share her experience with everybody. And that's a life-changing salvation. Let me explain the story to you before we take a break. George Sweeney, in his book, The No-Kill Guide to Witnessing, tells of a man named John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later, Mr. Curry was transferred and paroled on a farm in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, almost 20 years later, Currier, his sentence was terminated. And a letter bearing the good news of his, of his sentence being terminated was sent to him, but John never got the letter. No one ever told him about it. Life on the farm was hard. Life on the farm was rough. It was back and breaking. He had burden he had to carry all day long. He had no promise of hope. He had no promise of a future. Yet John kept doing the same thing. He was told by the farmer every single day. The farmer dies. Ten years later went by. He's still working. A state parole officer learns about the situation. She finds Mr. Carrier. She tells him his sentence has been terminated. He's a free man. I'm going to tell you what he said to her. Would, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message as this? Would it matter to you if someone kept a life-saving message from you your whole entire life? And year after year, the urgent message was never delivered. How many do you come in contact every day to have a good How many people do we walk past every day to meet you and everybody else if we don't share the message with? Listen, there's people in prison spiritually. There's people in bondage spiritually. There's people at your job that haven't heard the true life-saving saving message of Jesus Christ. And guess what? We keep it to ourselves because we're embarrassed. Because we're ashamed. Because we're afraid of rejection. Because we're selfish. This is what we need to do. We need to turn our city and our job places and our homes and our families and our neighborhood upside down with the message of hope. Rejection is important, but I'm going to share the message of Jesus with the wrong the way to hell. We're ashamed to share. We let fear cripple us. Instead of giving the message of hope, we just let life keep on going as it is. Alistair Begg says this. Withhold no part of the precious truth but speak what you have known and declare what you have seen. Do not allow the toil of darkness or possible unbelief of your friends to dissuade you. Let us rise and march to the place of duty and there declare what great things our God has done. D.L. Moody said this, I do not know anything that would wake up Chicago better than for every man and every woman who loves Jesus to begin to talk about Jesus to their friends. And just tell them what he has done for you. You have, you have got a circle of friends. Go and tell them about Jesus. I'm just going to say a question. I'm going to ask you a question. How many here are here tonight because one of your friends told you to come? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of you have invited somebody to do Right? See, we need to be sharing. It's not about free it's about Jesus Christ. But a lot of people don't know about this place. So we can reach them where they are. If we would all invite people, if we would all be evangelistic in our neighborhoods, even just one person, one new person a week. How many would commit to tell one, one new person a week about Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. One new person a week. How many would commit to, to invite one new person a week to freeway or your church? Where you go to church at? Let's do that. Let's see if we can fill this place full of people, guys. Man, I 